Hello, I'm Jesse Mollop and I'm a proud Indigenous man from the Larrakee Nation of the Northern Territory. On behalf of the Imperfects, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of the land on which they record this podcast. We pay our respects to the Elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge their spiritual connection to family. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are recognised for telling and sharing stories with one another, and the Imperfects draw inspiration from the oldest living culture in the world as they share stories of their own. The Imperfects invites you into a very safe place. A place where we share without judgment and drink heaps and heaps of vulnerability. Grab yourself a cup. This is the Vulnerability House. Mm, definitely couldn't have made that any shorter. That intro? <laughs> I've actually never heard it in headphones before like that, where it, I didn't realise it bounces. Yeah, it's a stereo. the headphone listener, it bounces between yes. yeah, left and right. It's mm, very fitting. Cool. The intimacy. Yeah. It is. The vulnerability yeah. has already started. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, well, uh, we have a special guest in the Vulnerability House today. You've already heard his voice. Um, spoiler. Uh, it's Oliver Twist, stand-up comedian, and uh, we've never met. This is a first time meeting, which is you know, sometimes we have met the guests who come in here, but this is kind of nice to be like a first time meeting. So it's like almost like extreme vulnerability because it's like we're, <laughs> we're meeting for the first time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This uh, is the extreme vulnerability house today. <laughs> yeah, it is a first time meeting all of you. So thank you for having me. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for coming in to the tea house. Is it, can I ask, uh, and we'll do your sort of introduction bio in a second. This is a really, I hope it's not a stupid question. Is Oliver Twist your real name or is that like a stage name? No, it is my real name. Okay. Yeah. Um, something uh, talked about in many of my shows, uh, including Jolly and Grio. And um, everyone in my family has a different last name. And it's just common to certain parts of Africa, including Rwanda. So uh, we can get more in depth into that. But yes, mm. yes, it is. Great. I mm-hmm. love it. Okay. Well, what I decided to do in reading in, in reading out your sort of bio to introduce you to everyone, I thought I want, I'm not going to tell your backstory because I feel like it might feature today. I'd love to hear that from you rather than a, a you know quick summary from me. So I thought I might just do a very quick summary of you, sort of professionally in the last few years, if that's okay. And then I think we'll get into your story a bit a bit later on. Yeah, if that's cool. So let's do it. So have you, have you, I hope you've got the right Wikipedia page here because if you start talking about the Artful Dodger and Fagan, then we know that we can, we, we've got it wrong. Uh, so Oliver was a Raw Comedy National finalist in 2017. He's also a playwright and an actor who wrote his award-winning nominated one-man play, Jali, about his family's journey to Australia the same year. He performed it in early 2021 with, his, uh, with Sydney Griffiths Theatre Company to rave reviews. And, it has, and, has, and has subsequently been nominated for several 2021 Sydney Theatre Awards. As a comic, Oliver has supported the likes of Kevin Hart, Will Anderson, Tiffany Haddish, and, Beckley, uh, and, sorry, and Becky Lucas. Just, just a reminder, Oliver, um, Hugh's a professional speaker. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, yes. We've discussed quite a few times that I don't get nervous doing public speaking. In fact, I mm, love it. Mm. I get nervous reading in public. Uh, I'm so bad at it. I think you're doing a great job. Can, I'm not. <laughs> no, nah, it's true. You're not doing a great job, but, but you're, doing, you, I think you're doing the job. You're it's, doing the job. Something is getting done. <laughs> yeah. So I've got so I've got Hamer Hall Friday night, and it's a sellout. Lots yeah. of people coming. Can't wait. Very excited. I knew I was going to be reading out your bio, and I've been thinking about this all week. <laughs> I'm nervous about this. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have a go at you, but... Um, no, I'm glad you've brought it up. Yeah. I think all, all of this is be going... I'm not going to sit down. I can't believe it got to a point where we had to bring that up. We did. <laughs> Halfway uh, through a bio. He's, anyway, I'll finish. Uh, he's been seen on SBS TV's Letters and Numbers, has performed on the Sydney... <laughs> Sorry, I've absolutely jinxed you now. <laughs> has performed on the Sydney Comedy Festival Gala and on the SCF's Roadshow, and is a regular on the Sydney Comedy Store. Uh, everyone, please welcome Oliver Twist. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Oliver. Is, is that the worst intro you've ever had? Um, no, <laughs> if, if you believe it. You do you did quite good. Quite good. <laughs> uh, but I, I thought you would not need to read it off 
the font. That's all. I, you know, <laughs> I might know it off, but commit it to memory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. He could, he's got stuff to work on. Reading is one of yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that was good. That was good. That was good. You, you got the bullet points. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, well, I watched your stand-up comedy last night. Okay, right? good, and good, I'm good, very good, excited good. about it. I think you're wonderful. So, oh, thank you. Uh, this is the Vulnerability House. We have a whole lot of cards in front of you. You're probably wondering, wondering why they're bluey cards, of all things. It's a long story, but basically they're the cards I could find on the day that we created them. So... <laughs> Uh, I've got two kids who are obsessed with Bluey, or, okay. or Bowie as it gets called at home. Bowie? That's Bowie? what Elsie calls. Oh, that's not Elsie. like a with, neg. Without the L? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, no, she's two, so she can't say Bowie. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. 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 She just says Bowie, Bowie, Bowie. Yeah. Bowie. Okay. <clears throat> Does she learn, um, is she learning reading from you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't look at that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so as she was just explaining um, how it works here in the Vulnerability House, Oliver, as you... Pick three cards. You can pick three from the top, and each of them will have a question on them. And if you read out the questions out loud, and then just choose one, whichever one, if any, speak to you. And if you've got some an answer that you'd like to talk about, if you feel comfortable, um, then we'd love to get a little bit of vulnerability <laughs> from you. <laughs> um, so whenever you're ready, I, I can Holly, totally just, do that. Yeah, should I just pick them and then flip them? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. there we go. There we go. God, you're doing it in such a dramatic fashion. This I, is, I love this. I mean, you're looking at it to put a drone sound over the top of it. <laughs> the, the boy speaks to me. <laughs> <laughs> Card one. If you couldn't fail, what would be your next career move? Mm. Interesting. Okay. okay. Now, I haven't listened to the podcast, but I heard rumors that, Hugh, this is a question you, you had been asked uh, recently. Yes. Um, uh, at a different podcast. Oh, if you couldn't fail. If you couldn't oh, fail yes. at anything, what would you do? Oh, what was your answer? You, your answer was stand-up comedy. <laughs> oh! <laughs> it, was, it was Will Anderson on Will Anderson's, but well, gee, good research yeah. from you. Wow. Uh, it, was, it was, yeah, I, it was right there. And then I was like, oh, that is interesting. Because I, I wouldn't pick that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Having you, seen you speak, you. <laughs> <laughs> Not in that sense, I was like, if if someone told me like knowing the beginnings of stand up, it's nothing but like failure after failure. Um, but that's yeah. good. It's like a a bulletproof kind of uh, career that you can get into. <laughs> well, that's why I'm doing Friday night show. That's what yeah, I'm to. I'm I, I, I would I'd be keen to come see it. But you're probably performing at the same time. <laughs> I, I am. I am. Okay. Um. Okay. Cool. Second card. If given a free pass, how would you want to be forgiven? Oh, that's a deep one. Mm. Oh, it's it's deep. It's deep. Hopefully with a full bag of money or something. Um, <laughs> people be like, money? No, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a money guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I came on the podcast. Um, <laughs> it's a pitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the third one, uh, where is home for you? Mm. I, like, I like that question. Mm. I like the questions. Very, very interesting. Very good. But if I had to pick, it's probably um, what is home for you or what is home for you. Yeah. Um, a question I have been mm. ruminating on for a long time in my career and personally in my life, uh, considering that home uh, changes for me and has changed for me over the last 25 years of my life. And... First and foremost, I was not born in Australia. I was born in Rwanda, in East Africa, post the 1994 Rwandan genocide. Mm. So I had to leave what I consider home as far as birthplace and location is concerned. Yeah. If you think of the word and what it means in that, in its essence. And then I lived in Malawi for 14 years as a refugee. Sorry, just so before Malawi, when, when you say you had to leave, under what circumstances? Was it a... Leave Rwanda, yeah. It was, was it quite a, a, a it's, dramatic? It was, and, I mean, <laughs> I, I joke about how we were moving, but it wasn't really moving. Uh, we had to get the hell out of there. It yeah, was, it was yeah. after the genocide, so um, very different to moving. It's not like we got a London notice, be like, you guys, move country. Um, yeah. it, was, it was a departure that was forceful, um, like many refugee departures. And then uh, because my family is 
Hutu and Tutsi, stemming from the two ethnic groups that were having the fight, the conflict right there and then, my dad being Hutu, my mom being Tutsi, very oh. conflicting in the same household. So either one of them has to choose, which they didn't, which I'm grateful for in the eventuality that allowed me and my siblings to be born and, you know, be here, mm. uh, which is good. So we left. We left um, in 2000, ending up in Malawi, and then lived um, as refugees in and out of Dalika refugee camp, which is still there currently. And when, sorry, sorry to cut you off. No, 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 no I'm, I'm so fascinated by when you say, I know you cover a bit of this in Jali in your show, but as far as like the the actual... What does that actually look like for someone you know, leaving Rwanda, being forced to leave Rwanda after a genocide? Like, what actually happens? Like, like, I mean, practically speaking, like, you make a decision, your parents make a decision. When is it? When is too much? Too much? And the decision is like, we got to now go. So, without getting into the needy details of it, which was really complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, Dad decided he didn't want to participate in the Hutu's extreme militia of eliminating everyone else, which mm. would be the Tutsis. The, they considered them uh, inferior and they considered them outsiders coming in and disrupting the native way of life, which were Hutus. So Hutus would have been the first settlers in Rwanda. And uh, we left because he didn't want to participate. And anyone who didn't want to participate was considered an enemy, you know, as in like, why are you not on board? <laughs> mm-hmm. That kind of thing. So yeah. he left um, with mom and me and my younger sister at the time, who's closest to me, Angel. So and how then, old were you at the time, sorry? You were four years old. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So and the you- aftermath of the genocide was lingering, even after the fact. So what happened is the Hutus started the conflict and um, the leader was the current president, Paul Kagame, is Tutsi. So when he came in power, he wanted to bring justice to all, all Hutus. It didn't matter. So dad was caught in that mm-hmm. kind of like um, revenge, um, you know, deployment that Kagame had started. So he had to kind of get out of there as soon as possible. Right. Yeah. And so are you, are you on foot? Are you, are we, you drive? We travel you? on... On bus and leave all belong- belongings, everything, every single paperwork, everything you can hold in ponds. Uh, some of your families, you live there. So it was the immediate family, me and your mom, dad. Um, and then, yeah, we end up in Malawi via a bus through Tanzania and then all the way to Malawi. They're not very far away from each other. There's a few countries in between, so it took a couple of days. Do you remember this? Do you have memories of this? I have fragments, memories of this, and the most I remember is jumping on that bus without knowing what it is is happening, Yeah, which is very disorienting for a young kid Mm. um, or anyone for that matter. So um, that's as far as I remember to it, and the journey didn't take that long, but the aftermath effect of it kind of, I felt it, you know, if you mm-hmm. will. But I guess at, even at four, I mean, I don't remember, I don't remember being four, but I guess by, by four years old, you're alive for long enough to know what home is, like where your home is, like as far as like where you live. And so then I guess at four, then to, for, to have that changed, like that, I imagine, oh, I don't know, but I, I, I can imagine like moving not by choice in the circumstances that maybe that would have an, might have an impact maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one, I spend many times kind of wanting to chase back. My family's back there, extended family, and mm-hmm. I've never been back. I can now for the longest time I couldn't because I had to one, uh, have a passport, which I didn't have. Um, and be able to travel there without setting off alarms, <laughs> if you will. Oh. Uh, by by that I mean like anyone who's considered Hutu and is traveling back there, once they set those alarms off, people are like, oh, what are you doing back here? No one kind of return to their home after being exiled, which technically you can consider being exiled, mm-hmm. displaced and kind of shut away from your native country. So what that does for me and 
what it does to my home is this disorienting effect of home moving on without me, you know? And I felt that throughout my whole life, kind of mm-hmm. be like, oh, I know where it is. I know the coordinates. Mm. I have Google Maps. Um, <laughs> but I just, you know, the the feeling of like, I need to go back there is, is a totally different one. Um, but nonetheless, it just redefined what home is for me. It really redefined what it is. And I have had to construct my own home wherever I am, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you tell us what it was like in a refugee camp in Malawi? Um yes, it was <laughs> it was it was nuts. Um <laughs> it was absolutely nuts. Nothing you can imagine, uh, to be fair. And so Zalika refugee camp where I was it was built for like ten thousand people. Currently it holds maybe thirty thousand people. So it's congested, as you can imagine. So you have all these NGOs that are trying to help you out, but you have to resort your own ways. So I resorted to just ways of making money that uh, were just just unimaginable. I used to bootleg um, music and um, videos, X-rated videos, and sell them um, in the camp. Uh, just kind of for money and so things like that. So how old were you when you were doing this? When you are 15. Yeah. yeah, I was like 15 or 17. So you're too young to obviously watch them. <laughs> so you're just selling them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah too young to um, <laughs> engage with them in yeah. a way that's an acceptable manner. That's responsible, um, yeah. yeah. And nonetheless, um, I was doing that. And to describe the effect of it, it's like we were in and out of it. So for the first few years we were there, and my younger sister was born, diagnosed with Down syndrome, so we had to m- move for on some unfortunate um, scenario, obviously. Nothing that can be helped. Um, so we had to go to the camp and get a permission and then move out of the camp to get to the city to go see a specialist for Bonita so she could start getting the physiology that she needed because um, for a long time she couldn't walk. And... Those kind of things put an infringement on certain things that you forget defining what home is. You know, it's such a a mentality and a space of survival and just making it out of there that you stop thinking about those basic things that Mm -hmm. everyone is afforded the privilege to think about. So the question of kind of what home is for me is, more important now than it is then, mm. if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. Can I ask more questions about the refugee camp? I've just been reading a book about someone who spent a lot of time in a refugee camp, and I'm, I think I had a picture in my head of what it would be like, but hearing someone describe it, I, I never, it's, I think like, it's exactly what you said. You actually can't really imagine it. Is it, you know, food and, and water and like, is there much? Like are there, are there taps at your, you know, close to you? Is it, are you walking down to? I can know? describe you. So the largest refugee camp is in Syria. They host about a quarter of a million people. That's a lot of people. And the first thing they do in any refugee camp, as far as I know, I don't know if it's changed, is you get a, like a card, like a food stamp card, and they stamp it every time you get food. And on that card, What it will have is your address, like a pseudo address for where you are located in the camp. That will be your home. And you get allocated a piece of land, uh, specifically in Malawi, where you can farm and cultivate crops. And that kind of sustains you throughout the year, right? And things like corn are very staple food in Malawi. Um, And out of corn, you can kind of make flour and make everything from that, obviously. Um, so you get allocated land, a house and that card, and you have wells and taps that are kind of set in between like small blocks of little huts, not houses, basically huts. And what there will be is a school for everyone to go to a mosque, a church. Um, and that's the whole camp. Now, some camps will have 
hardwire fences so people don't leave. Some camps will have you to need permission to leave because outside those, no one can protect you. No one will be able to protect you. Some people are like, this is our country. Don't come here. You don't have working rights, let alone living rights. Um, so Zaleka was no exception. And we got there. We had this little hut that had one bedroom with one window the whole place. And um, we were sharing literally a bed like five, six people sleeping on one bed, this tiny little space. And I remember thinking, surely there's something on the other side of this. Didn't know what it was exactly, but surely there's something on the other side of this. And when you say on the other side, do you mean like after this finishes? or After this finishes. Everyone that gets to a camp, it's such a limbo space. Yeah. You can't go home, but you're in a limbo space to be resettled to a different country. Mm-hmm. Now, the average... For that last time I checked through UNHCR, it takes someone 25 years or like 25 years to get resettled. Jeez. I'm 25 now. Hmm. Imagine just starting if I was one and knowing my old adulthood life, everything I know and growing up, having a lived childhood, a lived experienced childhood in a camp. It's not really a conducive place to say you've lived a somewhat normal life. Hmm. So... That was disorienting. I couldn't call it home. I don't wish to go back in a way that I don't have nostalgic memories about the place, you know? <laughs> um, so it was, it was bizarre. A lot of people are there to apply to leave out of there. And people in it, and I know people that are still there. I've left, it's been seven, eight years since I was there. And I got there, what, in 2000? And I know people that when we got there were there. And they're still there now. Really? It's, it's home. It's their home now. Yeah. They can't go back. Either they're fugitives, you know, exiles. They just can't go back. So it becomes their home. It's yeah. a place that it, if you ask me, I wouldn't wish for anyone for that to be their home. Mm-hmm. It's such a um, place full of scarcity as far as to necessities, the essentials that one needs on a day-to-day life. Um, and we were lacking that. And it was never a thing of like, oh my God, we should get that. We knew everyone else was lacking that. We knew there was a shortage of that. So it was a matter of getting to a better place where everyone else around us is afforded that. So I was never in my head space and my kind of mental place depressed about that fact or saddened about it because I knew it was happening to everyone else. Mm. There's that community camaraderie in a sense. but. Nonetheless, it was home for me for a long time, and another place became home um, when I arrived here. So you, you were, you're 25 now. I am. And so you were there seven or eight years ago, so you're a teenager when you're in yes. the camp. Did you, do you have connection like through internet and through to the, to the world, to the rest of the world? Are you like constantly in contact with like everything that's going on? We do, but... Um, <laughs> very slowly like getting right. to it very slowly like um you guys will get drake we're getting real wine um <laughs> you know it's like we're, we're really catching up to it like right. slowly oh, okay. the content is coming in and <laughs> like what's happened now with will smith it'll get there in a couple of years um, <laughs> oh really so <laughs> even though you've got the internet but you still haven't got access to current day you have to imagine the um not the access so much, but the, the day-to-day necessities. If I have a full day um, in a camp, you best believe I'm only going to log in on the internet maybe for two minutes. And right. I have really real needs I need to do. Get money from Westpac that I'm getting from friends overseas or family overseas before I can really get to the entertained part of it. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's, it's sure. an extension of one's gotcha. privileges that you can get to access that life. Mm. So even though I had like Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that, I only went there because I knew what I needed was practical things that could be useful to my life in the camp. Yeah, it was so, a, it was a it was an actual tool. It's an actual tool. Yeah, and the rest probably of it, it is for. it was probably like its original purpose was yeah exactly yeah. yeah. Mm. The rest of it is like what's the word rubbish <laughs> lineapo. <laughs> it's like a Spanish word i believe for excess extra mm. like what's gift. the word say it again lineapo okay. oh. yeah 
That's mm. how it felt. So wow, we had access to that. I never felt like I I was in touch with that world. It felt so distant to me. Mm. Really. Yeah. First time I watched stand up before I could be involved in it was there. Someone had sent me a copy of a Trevor Noah mm-hmm. special. He's a South African comedian. Yeah. Mm. And he was doing this special called Crazy Normal. And I watched it, did not think anything about it. There was no comedy clubs that I was like, oh, yeah, I'll write a set and go try it out in the camp. So it's you, the last you, thing on anyone's mind. You'd never thought until that point that you wanted no, to be a stand up comedian? No, absolutely not. It was, it was a feeling and a goal only afforded to me once I arrived here. Amazing. Yeah. There are no prominent Malawian comedians that I know in Malawi. Mm -hmm. There's someone from the UK, but that's only when they got there and they had the opportunity to do so. I mean, it is is truly amazing to me that seven or eight years ago, you're in a refugee camp and now you're performing at the Melbourne Comedy Festival. (laughs) Like that, like that is... It's a jump. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Talk about a leap of faith and kind of uh, a drastic change. The kind of change I'm only used to because I'm in in this scenario or because I went through the the kind of things that I went to. Uh, We're talking about earlier about one of the questions, if you could not fail, what what would you do? Mm. Uh, I was not terrified to get into stand-up. I was like, do you know what I've been through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to go to these comedy clubs and... um, Room runners would be like, hey, stick to your set, do a good professional job. And I was trying to build materials so I would do longer sets and just different sets. And, and so where were experimental you? with it in Brisbane, in Brisbane, where I first settled. Yeah. And they would scare me with like, you would never be booked again. And I was like, yeah. Uh, as if that's a real scary thing that <laughs> is going to shake me to my core. Um, <laughs> You're going to have to try better than that. You're going to really need to try. Um, I'm quite a resilient mind. Um, <laughs> oh, I'll never play at the comedy laugh factory. Oh, again. my goodness. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's such a brutal thing. <laughs> and. So that kind of thing is like, it's, I, I acknowledge it mm. for my health, the drastic change. Uh, but I, I try to use the energy for a more practical approach of using it to propel me forward. So I knew how far I could go if I could really start in this thing that's not really difficult than how my life has been. But what, what, what when you saw Trevor Noah, when you saw that special, yeah. what was it about that, that that made you kind of like lean forward or, or kind of like take note? Like, was there something in that that made you think, huh, that's interesting? He was funny. Yeah. Uh, which is a rhetorical way in. Like, mm. it's a rhetorical way in into telling people what it is you want to tell them. Once mm. they laugh, their defenses are off. Mm. You can be like, yeah, now I have some real things I want to talk to you about for a little bit. And then when you got here, what made you think that you could actually be someone like Trevor Noah? Like, what made you, th- like, in a new country... It was um, wanting to try something new. Yeah. I wanted to try something new. And I was struggling to see myself in the normal path that an average 19 or 18-year-old Australian would uh, venture into. By that, I mean uni, go do that. So I started out but didn't finish for rightful reasons because I didn't think I could be good at it. And I think... I still stand by that. Um, and took those skills that I did within that semester of creative writing and put them into my actual writing and performance. So I I thought I could have a career, like a strong career, if I really worked hard at it, something that could make me happy. And I wanted to maintain an oral storytelling tradition from my continent back home in Africa of griots and jallies. So it's not a coincidence both my shows are named Griot and Jally. It's a West African term for a storyteller. Mm. Yeah. Can I go back just, just to how you actually came yeah. to Australia? Yeah, of was course. It, was, it your, was it your whole family that came out here? It's my immediate family. Okay. So um, me, mom, and my sisters, um, and I have aunts, uncles um, that are back, and nephews and nieces that are in Rwanda. and. It was not uncommon for people to be displaced so the whole family couldn't leave for reasons of financial reasons. You can't take everyone. Um, And I was lucky that it was just me and 
my other sister before the two sisters were born in Malawi when we left Rwanda. Um, so yes, we've kind of stayed together as a as a family, as a core family. And how do you find out? Is it you're just notified by officials in the camp that you have an opportunity to leave here if you want? Is that how it works? It's a long process. We applied when we got there in 2000. Okay. And, and got accepted in 2014. Okay. It takes long. And like if you had 10 more years, that would be the average. That, that was actually quicker for us, the 14 okay. years. And between that, there's failures beyond our control. I wouldn't really call it failure because it's, it feels like I'm failing on how to be human because what I'm applying for is a better life. I'm not applying for a job. Mm-hmm. I'm not asking for my skills to be acknowledged. I'm asking for my humanity to be acknowledged. Yeah. And Canada was the first country to kind of be like, yeah, we could kind of take you guys and come through. Um, you, you wanted to hold out for a better offer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my negotiating. I wanted uh, more money, please. I was like, I looked at the, I was like, nah. Um, <laughs> pass. <laughs> I'll pass. No, um, they, they rejected our case and then um, we just waited. So it's the case of just people waiting for whichever country that year has a big refugee intake, whichever country that year is um, in need of specific countries um, who's at more risk and all that kind of things, things that are, have nothing to do with you. There's no way you could make it better. There's no way you could kind of fast track it in theory. Um, so you just have to wait. And so you find out it's Australia. Did you know anything about Australia or was it? no. Um, and evidently Australia didn't know anything about Rwanda or Malawi um, <laughs> after I got here, which, which was funny. Um, <laughs> um, we didn't know anything about it. What I think I knew was that we were coming to Brisbane. They said Brisbane, and then we ended up in Ipswich, uh-huh. which is not. <laughs> Brisbane. <laughs> you know when you go to a fast food restaurant and you see the thing on the big screen and it looks really shiny <laughs> and then you order it and then it comes and you're like that is not <laughs> this is squashed that is what what what's happening behind the kitchen i feel like this is this is fast this is really not what i thought yeah it is and that that, oh. that was my feeling when we kind of put up into Ipswich, specifically Ipswich, one of those places where it's, you know, it gave us Ash Barty, Pauline Hanson, um, yep. and Carl Barron. And <laughs> That's a broad church. It is. <laughs> it is. Um, and it's it's one of those places where my family still is, so I, I go there every now and then to visit, but I, I didn't fit there for uh, the ads or any kind of forward-thinking ideas. Um, so I, I wanted to spread my wings so I, I got out of there. But that's, With the, I would call that home. That was home for my family. And Ipswich, they're happy there. Yeah. Mm. They are happy there genuinely, mm. um, for better or worse. For what that is worth, they are happy there. And how can I front them for that? So that's, that's a home for them. And it is a home for me because those are my people and that's where they are. So wherever my people are, it's kind of become a home for me in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Without, I don't want to skip over what you just said before. So you you left Ipswich because it didn't feel right for you. Is that more around racial experiences that you had there with people, lack of yes, yeah? yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and I tiptoe around that and, word yeah, and, that and, carries and, a lot of weight these days, racial implications, because I refer, and not more often, I try to share away. I refer to my lived experience and of my hometown in Rwanda. What happened there was what could easily be seen as ethnic war, a racial war, if you will, between Hutu and Tutsi. But to my eyes, we look the same, all black people. Mm. Um, So racism never registered in the way that it registers for a lot of people that grew up here. I know it's a construct, one created to kind of, you know, inflict a certain purpose on me, kind of make me feel a certain type of way. So I choose to reject it, which is good, but nonetheless, it does happen, you know, and Ipswich was no exception. I talk extensively about that. I won't get into it now. Um, In my show about the first time I was there, I got pulled over by the cops and it's a whole thing. And that's only because my neighbors thought I was some kind of risk because I 
took a walk wearing a hoodie on the first day in Ipswich, literally. Mm. And it was it was terrifying and I I've, I kind of comically talk about it and extensively talk about it in a ha- in a terrifying way in Jali as it to give it its equal weight because mm. that's the other thing comedy kind of can be a little of a cop out a little bit like oh this happened but hey here's the joke um but in Jali I I go extensively about it um which I think it's an important way to heal and ha- kind of have it behind you in a way yeah mm. Because it must be a, yeah, I I don't want to, I I just, I always find it very confronting to hear, you know, I want to hear the background of why you've arrived here and I just, it upsets me, I guess, that it's not everyone welcomes you with open arms. But here's the thing though, Australia is founded on on arrival and welcoming of arrival into Australia. So I found it strange that the mistreatment was on the basis of specifically white people that settled here um, on, on a country that is predominantly indigenous and Aboriginal, not predominantly, uh, but at its core, mm. so to say. So that didn't sit well with me, but I find the, the comedy within it only because in my defense, it's, it's a lack of, to put it, it's it's say it's in safe terms to put it that it's a lack of empathy, but it's a lack of extension to the other, like a genuine extension to the other. You have to imagine the shoes I've walked through. Exactly, you cannot exactly. begin to do that um, to someone who's been through the kind of things that they've been through. And I've worked through those kind of things extensively, um, and I wish some people could kind of m- more extend themselves to that. And that's part of why I'm doing Griot and Jali in the way that I'm doing really personal, intimate shows about my family mm. and my lived experience just to extend that hand a little bit. Uh, I, can't, I cannot even imagine the feeling like you're in Malawi and you get the news that you're, you've been accepted to go to Australia. What Can you just ex- try to explain at least how that felt for the for your family, um, it was it was great news. Yeah, I can. It imagine. was great news. Um, if there was a soundtrack to it, probably be one of those Drake songs, <laughs> <laughs> like life is, life is good or something. Or yeah. started from the bottom. Yeah, started from the bottom when we arrived at the airport, yes. like in Brisbane. <laughs> That's like man, it started from the bottom. Now we're here. Um, <laughs> I, I think all listeners have to go and listen to that song because it honestly, it's so perfect. For that. I just had this great picture of you strutting through Brisbane oh Airport with us. I just, I want that. Um, <laughs> but was there when when you're in Malawi and you get the news? Um, uh, I mean, like, was there any sense? Because I, because you're obvious, well, not obviously, but I imagine you're surrounded by a lot of people who are like close friends, people who you've come to know over like 14 years who are all looking forward to getting that same news. Yeah. How, how is that? Like, it's like my terrible comparison. The only way I can, I can imagine it no, no, no. is it's like, space. <laughs> is like, where, you know, like you're waiting to hear in school where like who got what roles in the play. Yeah. And, and then like, like, Oh yes. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, yes, I'm Oliver, but that's a weird <laughs> play to bring up in this s- scenario. But like, you know, and then, but like, you know, and immediately, well, it's good news for you, but that means it's then bad news for the people who didn't get that great news. How, how was that something that you had to navigate with the other yeah. people? Yeah. Um, I remember my friend Trezor, who's still there. I'm sure he won't mind me sharing. Is uh, He'd been there way before we were there. He's from Congo. And we got on the news first. And everyone just tries to leave at some point. It's just not sustainable mm. so everyone tries to leave and we got the news and it's pretty a fast track process so you get the news maybe two weeks before and because they've been looking over at your case like the likelihood is that two months before they had interview you and all you're waiting is for a yes or no mm-hmm. we got the yes two weeks before we got super excited went shopping for some new clothing and kind of get everything that we needed pack it in bags um, leading up to it. And 
my mom kind of caution and i would imagine everyone is to stay home don't leave home in case something happens because if one of the members is missing that would mess up the whole case just uh. be be here make sure that we all live together that kind of thing and for my friends they feel happy for me obviously mm. and followed by that kind of wow when is our thing so it's it's normally a mass departure not just one family they'll go these are mono families uh going together not necessarily to the same country but it's the same departure mm-hmm. of a refugee intake maybe mm-hmm. around the same time a lot going to the US some going to Canada so you always that have that kind of thing uh where um we had families that were going to the US and I was like oh good luck um you know it's it's crazy <laughs> there uh, at every given moment mm. and um we had families going to the Canada some going to the Netherlands so it's it's a happy just momentous for a lot of people but nonetheless i said there's like 30,000 people there some people are not going it's just a fact and there's some people more coming and the hardest thing and i say this retrospectively is people going from refugee camp to refugee camp to try and get their application fast tracked you always hear rumors and eh? in kenya they're taking way more refugees this time around so go there and apply from there and people end up going there and then coming back we had a lot of cases like that and uh while the feeling to be happy for the next person is good there was always like oh man when is our case and mm-hmm. we we saw that we saw people leaving and we were like soon enough for us soon enough for mm-hmm. us and then finally got the news and very happy about it i remember mom getting the call so it's the UNHCR in Lilongwe the capital city of Malawi that calls you so she called mom she was very excited about it uh they called mom rather and she told us and we were super stoked about it and uh yeah from then on arrangements were made quite quickly and um yeah we we took the journey what what a strange i hear this and i just think i might have always thought this it hasn't taken this story to make me think this but You hear a story like that and to think that there are people who think we don't really have room for other people in our country. What is what a extraordinarily uh I was going to say sick but it's probably not that what a strange um policy response to have. Well, mm. I guess policy, but also anyone who thinks yeah, we just don't have room or to hear your story and so many stories like it of people who have been displaced through war mm-hmm. and then live in a refugee camp and then an opportunity comes to go and live in a country like Australia. It was just strange, it would have really messed up a response to think, yeah, we don't really, you know, I just, I find that it, it's it's very sad and it must be extremely confusing for you, I guess. It's extremely confusing for me now. Like right now, where, so the refugee convention after after nazi concentration camps was formed to reduce civil conflict right and when it was formed then maybe 50 60 years ago its whole goal was to have organization in place that could assist that make the process easy make those policies easy so at in any international law it's understood that a refugee is someone who i cannot go back to their home country and these are the rights that they are afforded and when i come here and look at it and at the base level that we have so many detention centers and all these refugees that are stuck in there for years and years on the basis that they don't have it can look opportunistic but it it isn't i'm not crossing the ocean to go find a job that's just not happening it's not it's not a, a risk i would take with my family you have to imagine to the kind of place someone has ended up with. It's the it's the edge of the cliff. It's it's like there's nothing I can do but jump and take that leap of faith. So you can hope to find or hope to land safely. That's all it is. Mm. That's all it is and you'll find some people easily recognizing that feeling, easily recognizing that pursuit, easily recognizing that. And if it was up to the people, I feel like the intake would be bigger. It, mm. There's no lack of opportunity australia is not really that much populated it's a very new country mm. so the opportunities are immense 
as far as I can see it. So um, it pains me to say the least that it's how we've chosen to treat with refugees on a, on a political level. Yeah, I remember hearing a politician saying, trying to, trying to justify their policies around that. And usually when I'm watching politicians, often I'll just think, I'll think of an argument in my head. But all I could think was, what the fuck is wrong with you? Mm. Like, that's all I could think. What the yeah. fuck has happened to you to make you have that attitude to people who are just trying to make a life for themselves? Um, not a question, just a statement. <laughs> <laughs> a no, it's, 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 a, it's a very common feeling. Um, and I've felt it for many years. And you try help in ways that you can. Um, and it's, it's like, if I talk to families and friends back home, I have to, they're like, how do you see it? How is it on the other side? It's, it feels like it's stuck on both ends, candle burning on both sides. There's not really anywhere it's going. Um, and to me, it's why that kind of politics doesn't interest me, um, personally or professionally Mm. to talk about it. Because I feel like it is dumbfounded in its core where I'm like, really? I've been to places, travel enough, lucky enough to travel where there's plenty of land. So it's that kind of thing where you're like, the bureaucracy behind it is um, complicated, but doesn't need to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, doesn't need to be, honestly. Yeah. I yeah. think we've never really done, we've never talked politics on this podcast yeah. ever before. It's just hard to not go mm-hmm. in that direction just for a little bit. But yeah. but I, I guess to come back to the question, where, so home to you now, you, you, you feel like it's, it, it's Brisbane? Is that, does that feel like home to you? you know, you're obviously away for the comedy festival now. When you think about home, that's, that's where your heart goes to? Um, I, had, I had a friend a little while ago and I was telling him a story about how I get not paranoid, but there's there's a repetitive habit that I do whenever I travel is I, I pack everything neatly. It's because of how I grew up, uh, one in the refugee camp and second in the city, but more so always traveling, always like, no, we're not welcome here. So that's kind of how I am all the time in terms of like going from place to place. It's not a justification of any kind of behavior, but it, it's rooted in a way that answers the question, where is home for me? It's never a physical place. It is where my people are, mm. friends, family, all that. Uh, lucky enough to have friends all around, which is good. So I can kind of come here and be like, oh, I'll see these friends. I'll catch up here. I uh, will do this or do that. So home has become a place where my family is. And my family has grown, like it's become an extension of me. It's become um, my partner, obviously, um, my friends that are really good friends. And because I'm actually allowed and able to stay in Australia, Australia as a whole is a home for me. Because I couldn't really stay or work in Malawi, it was never a home. But in a way, it is a home because... Chicheo is, which is the language in Malawi, is the one I was educated in, is the one I speak, is the one I sometimes dream in and think in sometimes. So um, it's kind of created who I am today. So it, it holds a special place in my heart. So it's one of the easiest questions to answer, but also one of the most difficult <laughs> ones um, because I know where I was born. I know where I live, but I also know where I could be at any given moment. So where my people are, where I will be, that will always kind of be home for me. So um, <laughs> my partner uh, laughed at me and said, when I go into like an Airbnb I, I, and we go out to eat, I always say we got to get back home because that becomes home. Like mm-hmm. I get into an Airbnb, I really settle in. Like I really, <laughs> I'm like, let's, <laughs> let's make this feel cozy for however long I am here for, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. And that's kind of become a, a habit of mine. Um, and where my family is currently is, is home. Sometimes they're like, oh, have you been home to see your family? I'm like, no. Oh, where is that? And I'm like, oh, it's in Queensland. And that's the feeling I'm trying to communicate to the audience in my shows, that it, it's so very disorienting 
um, it's probably not an easy question for someone in my position um, currently or before can answer, you know, uh, just for the effect of being disoriented. There's, you know, when you're like um, safe and able to have grown up in the same place, you always, you always have memories in a family home. For me, it used, like it's many houses, literally. Uh, because of how we like, oh, it's not safe here anymore. We should go here. It's not safe here anymore. We should go here. And not just in the camp, but in the city where um, xenophobia and any kind of um, hatred towards the other and immigrants was very prominent, like from the day we got there. Um, so it was not an easy thing and not something I thought about when I was there. Like I said, something I think about now. Mm. And, um, it's become where, again, sorry to use it over and over again, where my people are. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, uh, in, in Jali, there's a beautiful, well, there's incredibly beautiful moments throughout, but there's a moment where you talk about um, getting your citizenship here. Yeah. When that occurred, did that affect your sense of home or was it a different that piece of paper represents something different? It represent. I, I talk about it because it's important to me mm. and thank you for watching the show and asking that. That's, um, it's a good question only because for so much of my life where I could and could not be was very dependent on a piece of paper. Mm. And when I got that, I was like, this is the thing that many of my friends are kind of like, Yes, that will allow me to travel, that will allow me to work, that will allow me to do all these things. And when I got it, I was like, this is so futile. <laughs> like it's mm. really just could vanish in flames, mm. as, as I say. And I was like, it's great, but um, nationalism is, is not what kind of affords me good citizenry. I was <laughs> just as good as a citizen before that. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Um, for the record. Um, <laughs> and it is, it is a thing that affords me to travel. And it's a thing that uh, places me somewhere I can come back to. And I'm very glad and grateful. Yeah. So it's to, not to put words into your mouth, but it sounds like it's more of a piece of paper that gives you power rather than home. Yeah. It never identifies what home is for me. The power within it, not a useful, hmm, not a useful feeling towards me. I'm not walking around to someone saying I'm powerful. Yeah, I'm walking around to someone saying, "Hey, look, maybe we can do these things." Yeah. Um, um, it's such a. Um, I mean, it can show its true power in conflict times. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you can show up to someone to show up to an embassy if you're in trouble. Be like, "I'm from this country. I need to get back there." You can get mm. safety there. That is a prevailing effect of my whole life. I know that true well. Some people never have to think about it their yeah. whole life. And, but if you are a refugee, someone fleeing conflict, someone in danger, you can know the power that it haunts. So that is mm. never lost on me. And not to downplay that, but at the same time, um, yeah, I would never bring it up in a conversation as my ace. I don't know, like <laughs> my car, like yeah, this is the defining mean. thing. Yeah. There was a statement in, in Jali that, really moved me and I wanted to bring it up because I thought it related to the question now I'm not sure entirely that it does but there's a when you say the shame you felt of not being accepted by a place where you wanted to belong is yeah. that the phrase mm -hmm. do you feel like you belong in Australia that's a good question it's a very good question Josh does this <laughs> <laughs> Um, I I think I do. I would love to think that I do. I don't know how much useful of a feeling it is. Mm. Um, anymore that I can stay. It's more so of to feel safe in Australia more than I did in Malawi. Absolutely, like for a fact, without a question. That's more important to me than to belong in a way that answers the question. It mm. means I do belong. Yeah. So 
partly because I was not safe there, I did not feel like I belonged. And I I love living in this country. It, it's afforded me um, my career and my friends and family and it my partner. So it's it's good to be here and feel that feeling. It's something I'm taking for granted now that I I can easily get it, you know? <laughs> so it, everyone is prone to it. It's not just like a kind of like, oh, I will never take anything for granted. No, you just, you become in that, you be, you, you become part of that stream a little bit. Mm. Um, so yes, I do, I do feel welcome. Thank you. That's a good question. Never really thought about it uh. Uh, from that angle, retrospectively. Oh, beautiful answer. I yeah. just, it struck me that, Seem like not a bookend because the story is very much still going, but an interesting footnote along the way. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it's um, that's an amazing answer, and I am selfishly, for the podcast's sake, happy that you said you do belong. You do feel like you belong because otherwise, it would have been a pretty awkward end to the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, I don't. <laughs> which would have been a fair answer as well. <laughs> I just feel like we've 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 barely touched the sides of this extraordinary journey which is i mean you're 25 like you're so young and i say that in, and not in a patronizing way sometimes come but you've just got mm. i don't know the the we're 26 so yeah <laughs> 25 yeah, yeah. <laughs> couple of <laughs> wait till you hit 26 yeah mid 20s <laughs> no i just think about myself when i was 25 my gosh i was mm. probably worried i was thinking oh Am I too old to go to that nightclub like that? You should come to that <laughs> yeah. I just hear the insight you've got on the world and and your perspective and 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 your gratitude you have for the situation you're in, despite the fact that you're still not treated the way you should be all the time. Um, I, I find it, yeah, I feel very privileged to be chatting to you today, and I I think it's a really important conversation for three really privileged white guys to be having. Like I think we need to. Yeah, I, I feel very lucky to be chatting to you today. And people need to go and see Jali. And, and you're still doing that? You're still I'm doing still show, doing so that. So where can people see that? We have dates for Adelaide and Brisbane. And you can find those dates at um, livenation.com.au. And we are doing uh, Melbourne very, very soon. So I'm here doing Melbourne International Comedy Festival, but I'll do it outside the festival because it's a standalone theatre show and it needs certain elements of it. So we're going to be doing that uh, potentially at a good theatre that can afford us to do that. Uh, so keep a look on that um, wherever you can. And I'm really excited to just do it all around Australia as much as I can. It's a kind of show that I have to set distance between myself and kind of go do something else mm -hmm. for um, what it carries and within the show itself, mm -hmm. for those of you that have seen it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm super excited to do it. I yeah, yeah, I really encourage everyone to to see this show. It is it's very special. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Oh, thank you. I um, appreciate it. Just even the staging of it and the mm -hmm. way that it's presented. It's and that's that's part of it as well because theater just allows you to transport the audience literally to the camp. Like mm -hmm. you can take them there, mm -hmm. and that was important for me because I was like, I don't have images. I don't have mem. I don't have a visual receipts of what that looked like yeah. you have to mm. feel it there with me so the sound is important the light is important um the acting in it is important for me to transport you into that feeling that space so you can experience it with me for the hour mm. and then you can be like wow i feel like i was in it so i'm glad to hear that it kind of gave you the the feeling that we were going for in the first place yeah well it is yeah. like, because of, it is you're right it's so transportative like with all the sound design and and everything it's it's brilliant so um I mean, I, I wish the first time I saw it was not on a video. I wish it was live, but I will definitely say it live when yeah. I can. I've got to say, yeah, for anyone listening that thinks they've heard the story, yeah. despite how well you've told the story today, you ain't seen nothing yet. Mm. <laughs> you got to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Oliver Twist, thank you so much. Unless, thank you, mate. Did you? No, no, no just, no. yeah, we love you. That's great. Thank oh, you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, mate. Yes. Yeah. If this episode has been triggering for you, we strongly recommend Lifeline on 131114. The Imperfects is hosted and co-produced by Hugh Van Kylenberg, Brian Shelton and Josh Van Kylenberg. This episode was produced by Bridget Northeast, edited by Andy Hall, filmed by Andy Poole and social mediated by George Martin. A special thanks to Dr M for her expertise and guidance. We'd also like to thank the Resilience Project for their ongoing support. 
Our acknowledgement of country was delivered today by Jesse Motlock, and you can find Jesse's podcast, Deadly Discussions, on YouTube. Thanks for listening.